All right, guys, welcome back to another edition of Raw Intuition Inside Scoop. It's been a while since we've done an interview on this channel, and I honestly could not think of a better guest to start these interviews off again. Uh, today we are talking with Tony Wright, who is a consciousness researcher who studied horticulture and plant biochemistry at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, Scotland. Tony's been working on the issue of brain organization and perception for over 25 years and presents his groundbreaking and eye-opening findings in talks around the world. I'm extremely excited to have Tony here to talk about his book, Return to the Brain of Eden, Restoring and Connecting restoring the connection between neurochemistry and consciousness, and how we can use the information in this book to improve our lives and to set the groundwork for future generations. So, Tony, thank you so much for being on the channel. This book is amazing, and you know all the information that I've seen on the internet that you've put out is also just so uh, intriguing, and it's just so fascinating. So I'm really looking forward to uh, discussing this with you today. Hi, Matt. Thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation, and thanks for the great intro. Uh, yeah, no, well, let's see how we get on. Perfect. Okay, so um, I guess we can just start out with, you know, at one point, it's believed that human the human brain went through you know a very rapid expansion period and then around 200,000 years ago or so it suddenly stopped and potentially regressed so among modern scientists and researchers uh, what's generally the explanation that they have for why these events occurred you know why did our brain expand and what caused it to stop expanding and do you agree with kind of the mainstream ideas of what caused this and if not what do you think may have happened <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that should keep us going for a while right. um, no it's a good question um, well, I would say quite understandably, um, Western Western scientists in particular have been trying to solve the the sort of human origin story using approaches that have worked very well, or at least provided fairly coherent theories for pretty much all species. Um, the sort of classic adaptive selection ideas, the sort of Darwinian ideas. Um, and with particular focus on things like um, uh, social organization, communication, and suggesting that as, as, as going way, way back when we were in increasingly large social groups, tribal groups, this kind of thing, we, we needed significant brain power to communicate. Um, then there's aspects of uh, hunting, I guess. We, we needed a high degree of intelligence so that created a, uh, a sort of drive for our brain expansion and intelligence once we got into these more hostile environments. Um, there's ideas to do with the what our brain's made from. It's, it's predominantly made from certain kinds of fatty acids, some omega-3 type fatty, fatty acids. So there's been suggestions that, uh, or even theories, that uh, actually it wasn't until we got under the coasts and started eating shellfish. So there's a whole range of ideas. Um, oh, another another really in, intriguing one, I guess, would be, particularly with your channel, is uh, it wasn't until we in, invented fire um, and started cooking um, energy-rich foods, uh, starchy foods, and the heat, you know, makes the starch more available, as well as meat eating. Um, that's been cited as... Um, as a likely factor in the expansion of our brain, um, so there's quite a there's quite a number of theories um, to try and explain expansion. Um, some of them seem to be mutually incompatible. I happen to think they're all pants anyway, um, but they they don't really then have the capacity to address what to me is equally interesting. And and you've already mentioned yes, this accelerating expansion pretty unique and. Um, growing this very expensive to build, expensive to run neural tissue, um, 
and, and going just off the scale almost when you when you look at our body size and then we've got this colossal thing between our ears relative to almost other any other species of our size it's incredibly unique so you know trying trying to address that uniqueness using these traditional approaches um where it certainly seems to fall down is if you're going to explain the rapid expansion, you also need to ex explain the sudden stall. Mm -hmm. And the dates, I think, will be flexible on that. You mentioned 200,000 years ago. It's certainly a figure I've cited, but I, I, that will likely change with new discoveries, new finds. But at some point, it, clearly this accelerating expansion stalled. And there's been some shrinkage, certainly evidence of shrinkage in the last several tens of thousands of years and possibly even slight shrinkage going back to this kind of stall time. Um, so, you know, that is a very brief overview there. There's plenty of papers written on all these areas and books and so on, um, and people make their case. Um, I think they lack any coherent mechanisms. There's tenuous correlations at best. You know, it's like, oh, well, we, we were creating complex society therefore we needed intelligence well yeah okay but you know how does that work Where, where's the pressure coming from and why are there many or, or almost universal examples of species who've survived f for tens hundreds of millions of years longer than we have with much smaller neural systems or many species have organized social environments with much more neural systems and so on and so on mm -hmm. um so what, what, I, what I wanted to look at really was um, if the accelerating expansion was unique, and it is pretty unique so far in what's been discovered, was there anything in our history that was unique? Um, and it seems to me there is, and it's in the literature. It's not a new discovery or anything. Um, it's, it's pretty well accepted in the, in the arena of Western science, where a lot of these other theories have come from, that our distant ancestors spent a tremendous long period living in the forests, tropical forests, um, tens of millions of years. That's a kind of standard theory on that. And I'd agree with that. I think that's pretty accurate. Um, and not only that, so not only were we forest dwelling, but that we formed a rather unusual relationship with the forest. Um, it's typically called a symbiotic relationship where by degrees, and it varies a lot with the species, we were the seed disseminators for the trees, the flowering plants. Um, and by that I mean um, in symbiosis you get this kind of uh, slow co-joining of species almost um, where you get one species dependent on another and in this case um, it, was, it was our ancestral lineages eating um, the fruit of the trees um, and acting as seed disseminators. And as part of that process, we were provided with the, the ultimate free lunch, I guess, which is pretty rare in nature. Mm. Um, and that's, that, there's nothing new in that. That's in the literature. That's pretty much accepted. Um, what I think was missed um, and still is missed is... And it, it all becomes circular, and we might get to it at the end of the discussion because we're all using our current neural system to figure out who and what we are, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Unless there's a problem with our neural system, then we might be struggling to figure out who and what we are because our neural system isn't working. Right. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, what, what I sort of took from this history was that, okay, a symbiotic relationship with the trees, seed disseminators. Mm, well, actually, what you're really talking about is a symbiotic relationship where our, our ancestral lineages, by varying degrees of specialization, were ingesting not fruit, but the reproductive organs of the flowering plants. Mm. Now, if you kind of step back from that and just think about it for a minute, that's pretty damn weird. It really is. It's, it, you know, you, you could by analogy and just to just to highlight how weird it is let's say we found fossil evidence that we followed the herds of wildebeest or buffalo or whatever hunted them down and cut off the reproductive organs and that's all we ate yeah. like oh my god that's pretty damn weird yeah. and the thing is with reproductive organs whether they're mammalian or plant or whatever they're quite highly specialized they're there to do a specific job so with in terms of trees it's not the leaves it's not the twigs it's not the bark 
it's it's the environment that evolved to create a whole new generation of plants. Mm. So it's got really weird chemistry going on, mm. equivalent to very weird hormone hormonal sort of regimes in the mammalian environment. So that struck me as particularly odd. And once you start looking at the pharmacology, the kind of biochemistry of fruit really starts to come to life. It's like, oh my God, this stuff is full of all sorts of weird chemicals. Mm -hmm. And there's already plenty of papers published that these chemicals affect mammalian systems. So that's, that's the essence of what I saw that was unique. Symbiotic relationship with the reproductive organs of, of plants. And taking that a little bit further, because a lot of people will go, oh, well, you know, lots of people, uh, lots of species eat fruit. And that's true. Um, wherever fruit emerges in this kind of relationship, whether it's in the high latitudes, say where I live, mm -hmm. you get a lot of seasonal fruit and berries and all sorts of stuff will eat it. And some, some species are fairly specialized, at least when it's in season, they'll eat a lot of fruit. Um, what I was interested in was what happens if you can access this stuff 24-7 for evolutionary timescales. Yeah. Well, that rules out almost everywhere on the planet, certainly in our current climate regime and even in the climate regimes that, you know, have been studied through pollen records and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes, you get fruit seasonally and the season can extend depending on the, the rainfall and the day length and the temperatures and so on. However, there's only one ecological niche um, where, in theory, you can get fruit all year round and that would, that's what I'd term as the non-seasonal tropical forests. Mm -hmm. So you think about the tropical forests, what you've got typically, and I'm generalizing, you've got kind of savanna environments. And as you move towards the equatorial climates where it's getting wetter, it's sort of woodly, scrubby woodland, dense woodland. Then you start getting into the tropical forests, real tropical forests, um, where sure there's tropical fruit, but it tends to be in a wet and dry sort of regime. Mm -hmm. So in the wet season, you'll whether you know you may get a lot of growth there and then the dry season fruit or vice versa but nevertheless it's still generally seasonal but along the equator or close to the equator depending on the climate and the ocean proximity and all this kind of stuff um, you can get these niches where you're getting almost no variation in things like day length day length is important for season seasonal fruiting as well so day length is pretty similar um, night and day temperature pretty similar um, no real change in temperature throughout the year. Rainfall, similar enough to not really affect how the plants grow. You know, it's basically perpetual, perpetually wet. So you get these little niches, or currently they're, they're small niches, they may have expanded depending on the climate. And in principle, you've got fruit 24-7, and potentially for millions of years, because one thing... Uh, rainforests, tropical rainforests are is potentially quite stable. Um, they can be stable for very long periods of time. Um, so much so they generate their own weather. It's kind of stuff you know a lot of us are familiar with. Um, and they will contract and expand depending on the long climate cycles. But they tend not to disappear unless you get extreme drying. So um, what I was interested in then was looking for a stable environment that occasionally might fail. And that's exactly what you've got in these little niches. They're highly protected. They're, they're really deep, deep, deep in the forest. And I think, you know, it's not there's not been much written on it, but I think it suits our physiology exceptionally well when you think about some of the, the unusual elements of our physiology and just the basic temperature we need to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking at, you know, 20, 22 centigrade to be naked and comfortable well, you need that all the time. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of environments where those kind of regimes exist. So yeah, that's a little bit of backdrop. Very unusual relationship. Chemistry, very interesting. And these places still exist. Um, they may have altered a bit. Um, and they have the potential to disappear as well um, in extreme drying. Mm -hmm. Certainly the African forests where a lot of evidence suggests was, was the place of our general genesis, I guess, our general origins. The African forests tend not to be quite so wet as the Asiatic forests, the South American forests. They're still genuine tropical forests. Mm -hmm. But if you get extreme climate drying, certainly the African forests are going to be a bit more susceptible. And the pollen record suggests every once in a, you know, evolutionary blue moon, they can contract and almost disappear, virtually disappear. Hmm. 
Um, so what I'm saying is this relationship with fruit was a unique thing, and we'll get into the details in that a bit. Mm -hmm. Stable over long periods of time, but potentially fragile. Is there a difference in the uh, biochemical makeup then of fruits that would come from these tropical areas as opposed to what we get in more of the temperate climates? Um, again, it's a good question and I can't really give you a definitive answer because I've not been able to find that much uh, detailed information on African tropical fruits, for example, which is my particular interest because I, I think that's where all the interesting stuff happened but i think generally fruits you know the the flowering plants by definition are are related some more closely than others and fruit you know there's very little fruit that's poisonous to humans some of course and there's fruit that's not so great but the, the, there are generic traits with fruit so there are things in fruit you know for example where i live there's a lot of seasonal berries now clearly i'm not suggesting we evolved on them but there's some good things in them, you know. So, so, so there's some good generic things in, in pretty much all edible fruit. Okay. However, I would, I would expect there to be um, some traits in, in these tropical fruits where they've been in this tight relationship for long periods. Mm -hmm. I just don't necessarily know what they are. I can only speculate. Okay. Um, of course, it can, it can also be a little bit, well, if there's been extreme dryings, you know, um, is there still the same range of species in existence as there was 200,000 years ago? I don't know the answer to that either. Mm -hmm. But there's certainly evidence that um, there are still unusual fruits in the African forest. Um, I know uh, Bonobo is one of our closest living relatives. Um, they're particularly keen on jungle sop, I think. And a lot, I think a lot's been written about humans in tropical forests. Um, and it's quite tough and the fruits quite dry and harsh and they cite chimpanzees and this kind of stuff. Absolutely correct in the seasonal, wet and, you know, where it's wet and dry. Mm -hmm. But back in these more lush niches, um, from what I've read, and there's not huge amounts of data that I've come across, you can be looking at much bigger fruit, much pulpier fruit. And these jungle sop fruit that the bonobos like, they'll pick them and they'll hide them and, and wait till they're ripe. They're one of the biggest fruits on the planet. You know, they, they're starting to compete with jackfruit. They can be massive. Wow. So there's potentially big fruit there, you know, and, and if it's co-evolved with primates and some of our relatives, then I, I'd say the fruit would certainly have responded to that symbiotic relationship. By definition, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot, of the, a lot of the biochemistry that might have been very helpful to us would likely have emerged in that kind of environment um, I just wish I had access to it. I'd love to go and do some research there. I get my, you know, get my hands on some of the fruit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I'd say, without a doubt, there'd be some elements of that range of fruit that existed or still exists in in the deep African forests that had some unique traits. Um, you know, I, but I just I couldn't say for sure what they are. I mean, possibly particularly rich in certain kinds of chemicals because. Symbiotic relationships can be very powerful. If you have a species like us going around eating fruit, and there's a and, and through you know the classic sort of um, mutation, there's a fruit appears that has a bit more of the chemistry that makes us feel good. Mm -hmm. We're going to eat more of that fruit and spread the seeds. So you've got potential for fast track evolution there, where we're selecting the plants we like, and they're producing the chemistry that can change our brains. So you know you've got a potential for a very fast track scenario there. It's got nothing to do with classic adaptive selection, yeah. you know. So, so anyway, that, going back to your original point, I think that's a unique mechanism. And it's well written about symbiotic relationships are increasingly getting the press they deserve as being major players in the evolution of all sorts of species. Yeah. But we've grown up with this information that goes back, you know, 50, 100 years where classic adaptive selection was such a powerful theory and I think it's, you know, it's a good theory, it's not perfect, um, that we've kind of presumed that that is how we're going to solve our origins. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's almost predetermined. So when we started finding little bits of evidence that fit that idea, that's been pounced on, and nobody's really looked at what we know was going on for tens of millions of years. With this symbiotic relationship, now that we have, you know, we developed it, you know, long ago we've 
since gone out to areas that don't offer this same sort of, um, you know, the fruit to help with our neurochemistry and our brain. And so is there any evidence that's out there right now in the research that shows that it's having a negative effect on us, that we are no longer in that situation? Um, is our, you know, is our neurochemistry and do we have traits that are displaying that maybe there's something that is not fully functioning with us? And um, also, what if there is, was there any certain thing that got you interested in really focusing your attention on this when it seems like no other, you know, no other of the leading researchers are seem to be uh, using this as a focus? Yeah, um, I think the obvious thing, and I'm going to go quickly back in a minute to what was going on in the forest because I haven't got into enough detail there. But yeah, briefly, um, I think a lot of this journey was about trying to make sense of what increasingly appeared to me to be our collective madness. And I'm hardly the first person to comment on that. It's mm -hmm. historically littered with people going, you know, oh my God, we're crazy. Mm -hmm. and, and even my own madness, you know, the, the sort of madness of my own mind, the sort of fears, insecurities, the classic Asperger male brain, all the stuff that most people don't like to talk about. We just create a veneer to pretend that there's nothing weird going on there. Mm -hmm. so, so, so these were some of the intriguing areas. Um, and when I came across the classic left-right brain research, and bearing in mind none of this research has been done from the perspective is, are we in serious trouble? Mm -hmm. The presumption is everything's okay, let's figure out how it works. So a lot of the data that's come out of that I think is fascinating, but they weren't asking those kind of questions and still not, whereas I was. So I think that's that's part of you know where I've, where I've looked at this differently. And, and I think as soon as you start asking those questions, is there a problem here? Could there be a problem with our mind? Lots of pieces just fall together straight away. They're already there, and I didn't do the work. Um, it's just a question we've not asked. Um, so I, I think that area in particular, in conjunction with some early experimentation I did, um, where I had some experiences that seemed to tie into that so well, um, and I, I don't know if we'll have time to cover that today, uh, maybe maybe in a bit. Um, but yeah, that, that was, that was a, a big factor in all of this, trying to make sense of what appeared to be collective insanity um, right through to my own madness and the people I saw around me. And, you know, everybody's basically got some kind of neurosis going on. We, we're good at hiding it. We all know the rules and we don't say the wrong things. Um, but just taking a step back, Briefly, um, you know, I've, I've talked about what I thought was unique in our history, mm -hmm. um, but not really hinted at, at what impact that has. And, and again, we could probably talk for hours on that, but just very briefly, going back to the symbolic relationship with the reproductive organs of the angiosperms, the flowering plants, uh, very simplistically, what that relationship does when, when you're ingesting uh, these reproductive organs in quantity. So the more you specialize, and a lot of variation there, the more you specialize, you're effectively flooding your system with the reproductive biochemistry of the plants. And lo and behold, it happens to have what I am terming a juvenilizing effect. It, 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 it sort of dampens down the normal mechanisms that all species have, certainly all mammals have, where our sex hormones, things like testosterone and estrogen, Estrogens play a major role in our development. They turn us from embryotic, juvenile, um, through to adults and become sexually mature, which is part of the kind of classic idea of how organisms work. You get to sexual maturity, you reproduce, game over. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that mechanism, of course, clearly exists in us. But what I think was going on with this, this relationship, it was dampening that process down and slowing our development and keeping us more and more juvenile. Um, and there's a lot written about that. It's been well noticed that, that humans retain elements of juvenility, which there's lots of theories for that as well. Um, of course, my particular interest was our neural system. So what I think happened in, in, in a very sort of brief summary is we were flooding ourselves with this chemistry. It was impacting our whole physiology, but particularly our brain. Our brain's one of the most sensitive organs there is. It's very responsive to chemical changes. Um, and by dampening down the effects of testosterone and estrogens and creating a, a juvenile environment, if you, if you like, it, 
it kept us in that juvenile state for longer. And the juvenile state is when the brain proliferates. That's when it's kind of growing. Mm -hmm. And then you reach maturity, it differentiates, it becomes more specialized, and that's pretty much it. And then you start aging, and then you die. Well, I think this, this process kept us in that prolifer proliferating window. And then where it gets really cool, I think, um, as, you, as you build or, or, or as you have a, a juvenile brain proliferating, sort of encasing your old, more primitive brain, it becomes the executive layer. It's kind of the new brain that takes charge. It doesn't mean the old, old brain's not doing anything. It's just kind of the, it's the new manager, if you like. Mm -hmm. And juvenile brains, lo and behold, they tend to run juvenile hormone regimes. Um, so in our, in, our life, in our kind of life cycle now, when you're five, six, seven, eight, whatever, you're, you have a juvenile brain and it's running a juvenile hormone environment. Mm -hmm. So the fruits creating an environment allows us to grow more of a juvenile brain. It starts feeding in and produces a juvenile hormone environment. So you've got these two things together, the fruits keeping us juvenile, our new brains keeping us even more juvenile. And that, of course, extends the windows, allows the brain to do even more of this juvenile stuff. Mm -hmm. And eventually you get a runaway feedback loop where it just goes nuts. It, it accelerates and you get this tripling in size in a couple of million years. I think that's a far easier explanation. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one explanation for the rapid expansion and I think size is of interest but I'm interested in and it's really the mechanism that gave re rise to the size not the size itself it is it, it is a factor mm -hmm. but if we're talking about an increasingly juvenile executive layer that's when we can start getting into some interesting areas when you think about juvenility um, some negative connotations in our culture but actually a lot of positives and particularly things like the psychology of juvenility in lots of species, even aggressive species, mm -hmm. juveniles, almost like a totally different species, you know, so aggressive carnivores, when they're juvenile, fairly short window, quite playful, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot of fun going on there, less aggression, it, it right. doesn't last, um, but you see this in lots of species, and certainly in humans and, and, and related, you see much more uh, wonder and joy, I guess, this playfulness, um, a phenomenal capacity to learn just soaking stuff up because mm -hmm. we have this kind of uniform this very similar lid on top of our old brain and it's just able to absorb information um, and there's this psychology and I'm generalizing a bit of compassion empathy all these kind of things yeah. so they all go together in this juvenile state well all I'm really saying is we we retain this process our brain our juvenile brain ex expanded became ever more juvenile and we kind of retain those juvenile traits through our lives. We were kind of in a perpetual state of juvenility. It doesn't mean we didn't grow. We just retained this juvenile physiology. And if you, if, you know, if you extrapolate and think, okay, that capacity to learn, for example, you know, we can learn several languages when we're young really easy, like as easy as we learn a primary language. Try and do that as an adult, mm -hmm. and 99% of us, it's a real struggle because we've got this rigid, maturing brain which is normal, you know, maturing brain, that's normal. But I'm saying actually what set us apart is we retain this juvenile brain. So that capacity, that phenomenal capacity, and you see it in savant syndrome, you know, these prodigious geniuses. A lot of the really cool stuff's when they're young. Very, very few of the savants retain it till they're older. Mm. And those that do, I think there's a good explanation for it. They have access to the relics of this juvenile brain. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what set us apart. Um, and this was all underpinned by the symbiotic relationship with fruit. So really, and just to throw this in, I think really the forest grew the coolest part of our brain. It was never a classic mammalian brain. Mammalian brains, there's plenty of examples of them. And yeah, they're good at survival and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it took this weird biochemistry from the, the, the reproductive organs the flowering plants to change the way we developed, slow down our development, stop us maturing, basically, which sounds counterintuitive, mm -hmm. keep us in this juvenile phase where our brain stayed plastic, fluid, kept growing, certainly a lot longer than it does now. It's possible our distant ancestors, where we have no records, possibly had even bigger brains. It's, it's not like we totally maxed out what size of brain we could have. Mm -hmm. um, but remember, I, size, interesting sort of symptom but i'm really interested in this juvenile layer so that's what i think happened so the forest disappears 
through climate change or you wander out of the forest, mm -hmm. you know, curious or whatever, which I'm sure happened as well. Yeah. For whatever reason, we end up in these environments. And what, what that symbiotic relationship brought is many things. And I think the most important things we don't value anymore are our state of wonder and joy and connectedness, all those kind of slightly fluffy things. But in addition, what we value today is high cognitive function. Mm -hmm. Um, it's classic level. Oh, I want to be smart. I want to be clever. That's really cool. If only. Um, so it, we were equipped enough coming out of that regime to survive. Although some evidence suggests only just, even with all our intelligence, you know, we may have struggled to survive in these extremely harsh environments. But nevertheless, we did. Here we are today. Um, so do you think that's but, more of a safety mechanism, like an evolutionary safety mechanism, that once we wandered out of the safety of our, our, our tropical forest to more harsh climates, that we had to develop more of a testosterone-filled body that's more aggressive and more based on survival or not? I, I don't think so. I think that would have come back anyway because mm -hmm. we're losing this... this constant infusion of chemicals that inhibit those traits mm -hmm. well that's gone so they're going to re-emerge anyway it's possible that that for sure in more extreme in environments and cultures we've selected for a more aggressive version of that and to add insult to injury but i think that would have re-emerged anyway okay um i i you know i, I draw tenuous parallels with bonobos and chimpanzees mm -hmm. uh, i think all the apes have gone through this they've all gone through at different periods this expansion of a juvenile there, forest gone, and that process stops. When the forest comes back, it doesn't automatically start again for complicated reasons. Um, but the point is, um, bonobos live in a, a more protected part of Africa, uh, you know, much more equatorial. Um, and I'd say they've, they've not been exposed to such harsh environments and they've kept some protection. So their expansion stopped um, and it's it's possibly stalled, but not as badly as chimpanzees who tend to who tend to colonize um, more extreme climates. So if you look at the contrast between the two, bonobos, relatively speaking, and it does get overplayed a bit, but they're relatively chilled out, relatively cooperative. You know, I, I still think they're on this spiral of decline that that we're pretty pretty much engaged with now. But you, you compare that to chimpanzees. So bonobos, it's called matriarchal, um, it's generally less aggression and it's all worked out with, um, you know, much more gentle approaches and a lot of sex. Um, chimpanzees, much more typical hierarchy, much more the sort of what we see in humans now, this emergence of patriarchy, hierarchy and aggression. So I think, I think that would emerge anyway. You come out of the forest, that's going to start emerging anyway, not overnight, mm -hmm. but slowly. And with each generation, it gets worse because as this juvenile brain is exposed to these older hormones again, um, it affects each generation um, chronologically, I guess. You, each generation is a bit less juvenile because it's exposed to a slightly less juvenile environment in the maternal line, and so that goes on. So as each generation uh, emerges, it's a, a little bit less juvenile. Mm -hmm. And of course, a slightly less juvenile brain produces a slightly less juvenile endocrine system. So, you know, the it's a feedback in, in reverse, um, and probably very slowly, and then starts accelerating in the wrong direction. You know, it, it, the opposite of what happened. Very, very long period, very, very slow acceleration, then this colossal acceleration stall and slowly going over the crest and then picking up speed and going down the other side, which is where we're at, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, chimps and, chimps and um, bonobos, I think there's a tenuous correlation there that, um, you know, come out of the forest, you expose these environments, and those archaic um, mechanisms start kicking in because there's nothing to stop them. We're just going back to default, typical mammalian hormone environment. Sure. And... and we could all say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. And there isn't, you know, it, it's, it's, it's worked very well for survival, but if that's all we want to be aggressive survival mm -hmm. um, species, which is what's happened, I think, look at, look at what we're doing. And, and, and the double whammy with that, we still have the relics of this superb intelligence, you know, so you put intelligence in the hands of idiots and that's a really bad mixture. If we were really stupid. We'd probably do a lot less harm, but we're sort of a bit clever and really aggressive. 
Um, so, so yeah, I think that I think that's what started to happen, and that process has been accelerating. And I think you asked specifically, you know, for for traits. I go back to the left right brain stuff, and to put a different spin on it. If anybody makes themselves familiar with the literature, and there's plenty to read, and I can't condense it all here, mm-hmm. but I think all that's really happened. I'm looking for simple explanations here. Is our brain has been maturing over the last 200, 150, 200, 250,000 years or whatever. It doesn't matter exactly how long. Mm-hmm. It's been maturing. And as I say, you'd think, well, yeah, that's normal. But that's the exact opposite of what gave us all the unique traits. So it's been maturing. And because there's a, an inherent genetic asymmetry between the hemispheres, always was in all sorts of species, one side of our brain's been maturing more quickly than the other side. That's all. And the side that's been maturing most quickly, and you think, yeah, great, it's maturing quickly. No, no, no. it's the left side. It's 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 turned. It's maturing into a more typical mammalian brain more quickly than the right side, and bringing with it all the typical mammalian traits. Mm-hmm. So it's not as plastic, not as responsive. Can't learn anymore once that maturation's you know embedded. Yep. Um, it's not as bright. It's not as empathic. It's hierarchical. Exactly what typical mammalian brains do. Mm-hmm. So we still have a slightly more juvenile part of the neocortex in the right hemisphere. Mm-hmm. And that's where we can tap into, depending on what approaches we use, and we start to get a glimpse of what that was actually like. Mm-hmm. And it's radically different. And it encompasses all the classic traditions, shamanistic, spiritual, where it's, it's, oh, my God, and you want to stay there forever, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, any, anything to escape this dead thing that's that's currently in charge. But it's you know it's a sentient part of our being. It's 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 who we've become. So you know we're going to have to address that somehow. Sure. Um, but but for the most part, our left brain, I think, is just simply a, a more mature version of our right brain, and they're both matured more than our distant ancestors were when they had this very fluidic uniform juvenile there sitting on top of the head running the show basically mm-hmm. and i think that's the magic that set us apart and that's what we we've lost masses of that and we're at, at danger of losing it completely we're, you know we're at danger of blindfold you know uh, like blinkers walking off the cliff we're not aware of what the problem is we know there's a problem right. we're looking everywhere but where we should look so that's uh and i don't know exactly how to pronounce it but it's anosognosia is that right? The, the condition where yeah, yeah, that, that, that's I do use a few of those terms just to demonstrate that they exist, and people have written all sorts about them. It's it's a it's an unnecessarily complicated way of saying you know, I guess parallels with dementia. And I I almost use that analogy as to what we have species wide. We have a form of dementia where you you know when, when it's mild, typically mental health issues. Often you're aware you have a mental health issue. Mm-hmm. You know, most of us, if we're honest, know we've got a crazy voice in our head that comes out with all sorts of crazy shit, mm-hmm. and we'd be scared to share it with our partner, let alone everyone else. Yeah, most of us, you know, might be a few exceptions, and we've all got that going on. Mm-hmm. And do we do we make a big fuss about it? Do we? Oh, holy shit! We've got to sort this out. What is that crazy voice in my head saying all that weird? Uh, uh-uh, we don't even talk about it. Mm-hmm. So that that's the kind of where we're aware, but we're not. You know, so there's some awareness. Yeah. Um, as, as conditions get worse, as you, as you get worse mental ill health, worse, you, you end up losing sight that you have a problem. And I think for the majority of us, that's kind of where we're at. We sort of vaguely aware there are problems, but we're not looking where the real problem is. You can see it in everyone else. You know, we can see everybody else is bonkers, but I'm okay kind of thing. That's the kind of mentality that starts to come with it. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think that is, if, if we've got a serious species-wide problem, it's nobody's fault. Um, the first thing is to owning up to having it. Sure. And the history is littered with people who pointed this out. In fact, there were whole traditions when, going back to what I said, when we were less dysfunctional, we were more willing to embrace the idea and trying to do something about it. And some ingenious things came out of that. When the ego but hadn't it's, taken hold, right? Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, when, it, when, it, when it wasn't, I, I think two things, when the... the the maturation process wasn't as advanced. Mm-hmm. Sounds weird, I know, but that's kind of what I'm going to be focusing on over the next period of time because I think this is a, the better way to explain it, even though it's unfamiliar. So our brain hadn't matured as much. And then because of this asymmetry, because the left side of our brain was maturing faster and therefore losing function, 
and becoming essentially a contracted and more frightened version. Plus, we were out of the complex biochemistry ecology that this new brain really needed to run on. So it's a double whammy. You've got a frightened control freak starting to emerge mm -hmm. and something with the relics of high specification function, but it needs a complex bike. It can't run. It just will not work without, you know, really cool biochemistry. Mm -hmm. So you put those two things together and what you end up with is a dominant maturing brain that's really stupid and the relics of more juvenile advanced function starved of the necessary biochemistry kind of locked in the basement. Mm -hmm. It's still pretty cool. It still provides us with an awful lot of cool stuff. But in terms of fully engaged function, no way. You know, it's just not going to work. Yeah. So to me, it kind of sounds like you could almost classify the the left brain as almost uh, you know, psychopath. It seems to, you know, it even if it understands that there's something wrong, it'll make up stories in order to convince itself and others that, that it's fine. And, and it just looks to you know, create excuses for reasons why it can continue to do what it's doing. Is that right? Yeah, and, and the evidence is overwhelming for that. Again, it's not my research. It's, there's endless amounts of research. Of course, there's, there's efforts to explain it away. It must be some evolutionary ad adaptation. There must be a good reason for it. Mm -hmm. it. It never seems to enter anybody's head. Maybe this is a sign of severe pathology, you know, because yeah. in any other circumstances, it would be severe pathology. But no, because it's inherent in our condition, well, there must be an adaptive explanation for it, in fact. And I mention this a lot, that there are PhD papers written, for example, on trying to explain why humans are so um, self-deceiving, um, self which we are. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, so, so people have gone to great lengths. So, well, maybe it's because, oh, you know, maybe we wanted to hide bananas from our friends or something. So we, but it just, it's just absolutely absurd because it gets to the point, well, if we're so good at self-deceiving, we don't even know why we've done it. We don't even know what we're doing. You know, it's just absurd. But if, if you ask the question, well, maybe this is a symptom of pathology. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it makes sense. It's challenging, but at least it makes sense. Um, and going back to your point on, you know, psychopathy and sociopathic behavior and so on. Yes, that's one way of looking at it. And, and I think it's accurate, but it's really, uh, you know, if, if you go out into the wild and, and have a discussion with, um, God, I can't think of a good, uh, you know, uh, a leopard or something, you know, it's very honed at what it's doing. It's good at what it's doing. And you say, actually, it'd be really cool if we did things differently and it would be better for everybody, including you. And it's like, yeah, and bites your head off because it's, it, it's just not going to, it's not going to engage. It doesn't have the capacity to do anything other than what it already does. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really what it is. It, it's easy to use these labels, and I do use them, um, but it sort of brings with it a sense of blame and um, and choice when really I think what we've got is this maturing brain, its structure's changing, it's differentiating, it's not this uniform juvenile layer, and that's nobody's fault. But it does bring with those, those traits, instead of thinking of them as psychopathic, although I think they are, they're more typical primitive mammalian behavior that's all it's yeah. horrific and it's very dangerous again when you put that in the hands of a species it still has access to some intelligence yeah look at what we do with it but that's all i think it is it's just this maturing brain it's turning back into a more typical mammalian brain but not quite because it's shrinking and it's losing structure and so on so it's a bit of a mixture it's reverting to type and it's turning in combined with turning into a typical mammalian brain that, I think, is the essence of our challenges. Yeah. But, of course, that's the dominant part of our brain now, so that's what we're looking through and using to figure out what's going on. And it really isn't very bright, and it can't see beyond what it can't see. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 there's certainly scope to talk about certain elements of our behavior as bloody-minded, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of it is about we don't have any choice. That's what it does. It's, again, using crude and overly simplistic analogies. You, you think of, you know, old dogs and new tricks. Well, most of us, as we age, you know, the brain, brain's maturing even more. It's becoming even more rigid. Mm -hmm. So using that stereotypical uh, old man, for example, you know, um, that so rigid, so set, can't even do anything different. Yeah. Well, I think we've all got that. It's just not as obvious when we're younger because we think, Oh, yeah, I, you know, I'm cool, I can do this. But we're already on that path of 
contracting capacity, whether it's perceptual, behavioral, whatever. Um, and you see, you see this in mammals. They have this plastic juvenile phase where they learn their life skills. The brain matures for sexual reproduction, the classic sort of Darwinian stuff. And those skills learned early on is pretty much all they've got. It's very difficult for them to learn anything significant that's new. Um, and that, that, that's fully functional in mammals. Well, I think we're now, oh, perhaps for the last few thousand years, we've been reverting back to that. We call it beliefs. We call it conditioning. Yeah. We give it all sorts of fancy names and we justify it. No, no, no. This is the brain atrophying before our eyes and it just cannot, cannot, it cannot move anymore, if that makes sense. It cannot engage with new stuff. In fact, it's terrified of new stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's not an adaptation. To me, it's a pathology. But we know, again, from personal experience, though, there's enough evidence to suggest that part of our brain somewhere, if we can bloody well find it, can transcend those rigid beliefs, behaviors. And it's usually described in rapturous terms in a sense of liberation, escape. And I think it actually is. Where even in all the people, there's that sudden that plasticity is back, that joy, that wonder, that the fear is gone, the inherent fear is gone. So I think there's an awful lot of clues in here. You know, I, I haven't laid out a lot of the basic biology because at the end of the day, it's on other talks, it's on other websites and stuff. But, you know, some of these general patterns, I think, are very important. Mm -hmm. And if you just step back and observe, you start to see this coherent idea. Yeah, you know, we're, we've got a lopsided neural system. One half of it's in serious trouble, but that's what we're using to figure out what's going on. And it hasn't got a hope in hell of figuring it out experientially it, it doesn't have the capacity but what you can do is look at the objective data mm -hmm. or relatively objective data and if i if what i'm saying is correct and what i'm saying is what people have been saying for endless millennia that we're in serious trouble all the spiritual traditions are really about that yeah you know we shouldn't call them spiritual traditions because it gives the left brain an excuse to go oh, bullshit or whatever yeah. they're really the first symptoms are when we became aware of the symptoms of what i call a neurological condition and people were very concerned and they spent an inordinate amount of time and effort trying to figure out what was wrong and how to treat it. That's all. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more mysterious going on than that. I mean, that's not to say it's not amazing, but it, it's not this great mystery. It's, you know, we were losing neural function and we, we've, we knew we were new, new losing neural function. It's there in all the ancient traditions. They talk about a distant time when things were different. We were all connected, blah, 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 all that amazing stuff. I think that was real. Something happened and something emerged that was very, very different, something akin to what is human being today, more primitive, more frightened. And what crops up a lot in these traditions, which you probably come across, is sliding into delusion. How, how specific could these traditions be? Sliding into delusion. Yeah. And then you look at the left-right brain literature in detail. Oh, my God, our left hemisphere is the most deluded thing there is. Right. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. Yeah. I think it's evident that, you know, when people continue to do things that they know is wrong, you know, most of us still have that part of us that we feel that it's wrong and it, we know that we shouldn't do something, yet we still convince ourselves to do it. So it does show that there is still that flickering of hope that there you know we can tap into that side of us that you know the right brain that will help us get more in connection with our you know our compassion empathy our, our intuition so um yeah i mean there there's still hope right oh absolutely i you know I, i'm still i still feel like after 25 years i'm still trying to come up with a a tight and simple diagnosis to me that's the priority I, of course i'm utterly excited about what can come after that and, mm -hmm. and impatient and want to get on with that but without without a, a credible understandable to the dominant left brain diagnosis it's a waste of time i mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. um and i feel there is progress there and there's lots of good information around in all sorts of disciplines i mean what you're talking about with the sort of you know being able to draw a little bit on the right side of the brain to update our reality. This, this paper is written on that. There's a, there's a really quite interesting paper by a chap called Ramachandran, 1996 or somewhere around about there. And he talks about this stuff um, and talks about, you know, 
he uses military analogies, if I remember. It's a long time since I've read the paper, but um, really sort of talking about where the, the data that's conflicting with your beliefs reaches a critical mass. Eventually, it, it, it forces your ego mind to fail. It just can't cope anymore. It's, it's finally, you know, it, it's, it's in its face. No, you know, it's not black, it's white, or it's not square, it's round. And, and eventually goes, oh, okay, I can't cope anymore. And it kind of it, it temporarily gives way to something else that updates reality, and then it takes over again with the new reality. But that that's that's rare as you get older. But it can happen. You know, people can be almost the left brain can be frightened into giving up, and that's one approach that used to be used. Yeah. Um, but while it's in charge, you know, while it while it's perceptually dominant, it's very very difficult. You have to push it out of the way. You have to encourage it out of the way. You have to present information that is so powerful it just has a mind meld or something like that and gives up. Yeah. Um, or, or, of course, there are all these practices, techniques, or I call them treatments, that have filtered down from all over and all sorts of traditions. And when you strip all the baggage away, all the beliefs away, which they kind of suggest you should do anyway, mm -hmm. if you read between the lines, um, they're really looking at, to my mind, the techniques treatments to inhibit our now overly mature and rather stupid left brain that's causing us all this problem. So how, how do you dampen its influence and simultaneously re-engage the relics of this more juvenile, more functional brain? That's all they were trying to do. Yeah. Of course, when I say that's all, it's quite complicated because, you know, you have to rebuild the thing, you have to refuel it, then you have to inhibit the left and engage the right. But if that's all we've got to do, when you look at actually what we're on the cusp of doing globally now, yeah. that's no big deal. I, you know, I'd rather sign up for that than building stealth bombers and intercontinental ballistic missiles or whatever. Right. Okay, let's let's fix our brain. It might take a little while, but collectively, with the resources we've got at our hands, including technology and whatever, we could probably turn this around quite quickly. So going back to your point earlier, you know, about hope, I am very hopeful. The biggest herbal... Her hurdle is to recognize the severity of the condition and exactly where it exists. But I think we've already discovered that, you know, Western science, I think it has its failings, but it's generated a mountain of data in left brain language, mm -hmm. mountain of data. And I think if there was a serious problem with our brain, the, the data would have been generated because we've dug everywhere, we've, we've gone through everything. And I think it has, I think we've got most of the data we need. We just didn't know it was there. We didn't ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. But when you start asking these questions, it's there. It's there in psychology. It's there in neurology. It's it's everywhere. Yep. It's just fitting the bits together. And it's like, oh, okay. You know, it's... Um, I, there's there's um, a, a rather base, you know, not, not a particularly deep Hollywood film, but I, I quite like, you know, some of these metaphors because it can transfer mm -hmm. quite quite well. And it's a film called 50 First Dates, I'm not saying it's a great film, there's some quite interesting stuff in it where one of the main characters has a car accident mm -hmm. and she loses her memory. Every every night she goes to sleep, she wakes up with a clean slate like it's day one again. Um, and she, she gets involved with this guy, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he comes up with this idea and he makes a, I think it's a videotape that she, you know, there's a label on it, play this. So first thing in the morning, there's a videotape. And it explains to her what's happened. And it's it's quite horrific initially. There's a lot of emotion, a lot of tears and whatever. But within half an hour, an hour, it's like reset. It's like, okay, now I know what's going on. You know, and I think that's what that, that's the first step. We need to be able to explain to ourselves what's happened. Yes, it's horrendous. Look at the look at the mess we're making. This is why. And then we can get on and fix it. And I think that's eminently doable if there's a problem with our brain. But we've we've got to ask, is that possible? And and Western science hasn't done that. It's made it, by its own definition of science, it's made a, cl a classic mistake. Mm -hmm. We've presumed our neural system works. That's really bad science. You never presume anything works. You check it, you test it, you calibrate it, you look for problems. We've just presumed it works. Aren't we so clever? Let's figure out how it works. Is it working at all? Never entered anybody's head, except our ancestors who were actually screaming at us, we're in deep trouble here, there's something wrong with our mind. Yeah. So, you know, you've got these two things going on, which one holds the most water? We're fully functional? 
I don't think so. <laughs> There's a serious problem. Mm. And then you look at the data in Western science, oh my God, all the pieces are there. Yeah. So with all the pieces there, <clears throat> and so many people working on this, um, you know, looking over this data, it begs the question, is there a conscious effort going on by, say, government or big industry or some other power structure that doesn't want this information to be known and to keep our left brain more dominant so that we are more of a primal animal? I, I don't personally think so to that degree. I think there's a lot of elements of that that come with a, a maturing mammalian left brain. I think I think there's a you know hierarchy need for control, fear. So there's a lot of that kind of control does go on, mm. but not not to encompass that whole idea. I don't think. I, I'd certainly like to think not anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I'd see that all as symptomatic and totally expected. Of a, of a neural system that's crashing and, mm. and we've created cultures that allow, you know, a, allow the the relatively small percent of psychopaths to get together and run things, you know, mm. so, so we've got lots of accelerating problems. But I don't think, I don't think there's somebody sitting there thinking, oh my God, we could have vastly more function, let's lock that away. Mm. It, 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 even, even to a psychopathic mind, it's like, oh, I'd like that function. And of course, to get into that function, the psychopathy goes away. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I don't think to that degree, but I think a lot of elements of it and, and almost without realizing what's going on. So, so yeah, what, what we might call a lot of creative right brain thinking does get shut down, but not because it's part of this potentially big idea it's just a reaction it's just frightening it's just lock it away keep keep it all in control so you so see yes and no I, I think i think there is a lot of that going on but not with an awareness of the bigger picture okay. i don't think that's possible to have that left brain doesn't do that very it just tends to react it's like mm -hmm. how can i stay in control that's all it's trying to do gotcha. and through through utilizing lots of approaches including drawing on right brain genius it's, it creates structures to stay in control. So, so yes, but but not because there's an understanding that we have this massive capacity locked away. I don't think. I mean, I could be wrong, but it's almost like uh, the status quo industry. Um, I kind of see that as the left brain, and grassroots movements are like the right brain. So you know, maybe it's just kind of a balance that that's taking place, but. Uh, um, I yeah I, I first of all you know there's so much ground we could cover and can't cover it yeah, all yeah. but I, I just want to be clear that in our current state there's definitely a spectrum of this condition mm -hmm. this there's degrees of what I call maturation in the past I would have called it damage I still do but it's degrees of maturation there's degrees of chronic biochemical deficiency you know diet related all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. there's the beliefs that have been imprinted on us, depending on our culture. There's all these factors, um, and then the balance between the left and right, that varies a lot as well. Um, although I think we're all left brain dominant, some people like to think not, but I think it's degrees of, and some people much less so. So that's that's why you get, and I've always got that, you know, um, hierarchy of fear, the more the more you're stuck in that damaged, frightened state, the more you want to be in control. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not your fault. It's just a reaction because it's terrifying. Moving down that spectrum to people who aren't as afflicted, I'm not saying not afflicted, but not as afflicted, so they don't have that cr crushing desire to be in control and the more relaxed, the more creative. So that's why you see that dichotomy all through history and still do today. Yes, degrees are. But overall, overall, we're still heading in the wrong direction. You know, um, we might have great communication now, internet, all sorts of stuff, and we're connecting with all sorts of cool people. But overall, the juggernaut's still hurtling over the cliff. Yeah. Um, and uh, the worst extremes of the condition are getting worse, I think. You know, the psychopathy is getting worse, the soci and so on and so on. So, so I think seeing that, that variation still is a sign of hope. But on its own, I don't, you know, I, I think we've seen what you might call grassroots behavior through recorded history and, mm -hmm. and probably well beyond but certainly recorded history um and ultimately here we are 
you know, it hasn't been enough to yeah. stop this madness. It, maybe brief glimpses. And, and the other thing the madness does, although I hope it doesn't happen now, is it it, it crushingly controls to the point where it squeezes, you know, you, you get you get cultures emerging that become more and more hierarchical and then they collapse again because mm -hmm. it's unsustainable. We're obviously seeing signs of that now, but we, it's such a universal culture that it would be a, you know, it would make the collapse of the Roman Empire look like a, a picnic. So, I, you know, I don't think that's an answer either. You know, we really need to somehow put the brakes on and start tiptoeing back from the, from the precipice. And, and we're never going to do that until we recognize where the problem is. And it's not the bankers, it's not the polity. They, they might exhibit more of those traits. Mm -hmm. Collectively, we've got a problem, which is exactly what the ancient tradition said. They didn't say a few people have got it. You know, the, the inference was we've all got it. Yeah. And some people are lucky. They're either born that way because of imbalance like the savants or through a lot of work, they gain a bit more insight and then we get right brain insights into all this. And the insights can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. But unless we understand the mechanism, unless we can all start moving into that space increasingly sustainably, even that's not enough, I don't think. And we have we have endless, endless amounts of clever philosophy and, 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 you know, very, very insightful material. And I think that has its place. But until we can figure out how we can all start moving into that space, mm -hmm. we're, we're lost. Yeah. But I think we can. I, you know, I just want to add that on at the end. I think yeah. we could, do, you know, as I say, to me, after 25 years, and I don't want to sound arrogant because um, people have been studying this forever as well, but I, I think all I'm doing is agreeing with the ancient traditions. I'm not saying anything new. Mm -hmm. There is a problem and there are ways we can deal with it. And they're actually quite simple. Once we drop all the left brain baggage, it's not a mystery. You know, it's, it's, it's a very simple map. And once you follow the map, it takes you to a place where the map's not relevant anymore. It's, it's a different state of awareness where, oh my God, how on earth could we have been the way we were not seen it? Well, actually, there is an explanation for that. And in the same way that people get temporary remission from extreme dementia, you know, they can come out of it briefly. I actually think that's a classic left-right brain shift because the left brain gets dementia earlier, mm. as it would. And, of course, we're all left brain dominant, but people still have lucid moments. Now, how can that be? How can you have a totally dysfunctional brain then briefly, oh, I remember everything, everything's fine. You know, there are yeah. examples of that. And then it goes away again. What the hell is going on there? Well, it, again, it fits. And I think as a species, that's kind of where we're at. We're, we're now in full-blown dementia. We occasionally get these glimpses and we know there's something weird going on but we can't put a finger on it and then it's gone again um you know so, so though it's, those are a little bit more than analogies i think they're actually accurate depictions but in an evolutionary sense rather than a lifetime sense mm -hmm. you know where we're now sort of we've eaten a terrible diet we've got no antioxidants we've done this we've done that and we're about 18 we've got dementia um but you know there's still a chance to turn this around we've just got to somehow recognize of course it's a tough one because you know we've got denial we've got confabulation we're frightened of anything different um so it, it, we've, we've got to somehow find a language that the left brain can understand not be too frightened of and actually want to engage with even though ultimately it's going to mean that it's going to be pushed out of the way mm -hmm. but it's actually not very bright so it'll, it'll run it gets excited about ideas so you know i want to be intelligent i want to feel amazing mm -hmm. let's do it it won't be the thing that experiences those things it'll be the thing that's sidelined until we can figure out how to fix it but it doesn't matter yeah. i'm rambling on now <laughs> no, it's okay it's all very interesting um so going back to the point where you mentioned that it seems like we're at an accelerated rate of decline um what role do you think the the culture that we have today of meat and animal-based products being the centerpiece of people's diets, um, more acidic diets, things like that, in contributing to that? Because it seems like, it, I mean, obviously, as time has gone on over the last 50 years, we have increased, you know, dramatically the amount of animal products we're consuming. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that is playing a major role in the increased decline in our in our right hemisphere being able to function? Yeah, it's accelerating the process. It, it, again, it's 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 it, it's just turning the clock back to that more primitive mammalian state. And, and depending on your beliefs and what data you sort of decide might work, you know, it, it looks like certainly. And I have no problem with this. 
are really distant ancestors way, way back before the symbiosis were insectivorous, mm. which is effectively carnivorous. Mm. And again, that's fine. That, you know, that's, that does what it does and it survives and it works. Mm-hmm. Um, I think as we've, we've lost this unique fruit symbiosis, um, juvenility, and it's regressing, of course, it, it starts to almost move itself. You know, it, 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 it becomes, oh, certainly your left brain is more, potentially more potential to be carnivorous because it is a more prim- primitive form but of course that accelerates the process as well mm-hmm. so, so it's you know i don't want to sound too judgmental it's difficult sometimes but it's like yeah we, we can follow that route and we are following that route mm-hmm. it doesn't look very good to me and all the biochemistry is exactly the opposite of what we need to reinitialize this process to get this process back on track yeah. that's that's totally a, a, a direction that's just going to accelerate our decline into a more primitive state. Now we can choose to do that, mm-hmm. you know, that is our choice. But more aggression, more hierarchy, shorter lifespans, more sickness, because we're not re we haven't, despite what a lot of people superficially claim, we haven't evolved to eat this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're like a post-symbiotic anomaly that was programmed to eat fruit, but our brains changed a bit, so we're not even fully programmed to eat that anymore. You know, our neuroassimilation system isn't in the forest anymore, mm-hmm. um, and it, it's it's drifting towards its more primitive form. Um, we can choose to stop that, and I think there are steps we can we can take. And we see, you know, you've probably seen this a lot as well, where without addressing any of these big questions, people on a standard diet they switch to a plant-based diet and up the percentage of raw food and oh my god it's a transformation relatively speaking yeah you know well we can we can make those choices or we can end up being beyond the sickest creature hell-bent on self-destruction mm-hmm. and my in you know as you probably gathered my main interest yes our physiology yes our health of course they're all important but i'm really interested in our state of mind and all this this kind of increasing animal-based diet and junk food and whatever is trashing the relics of, of, of uh, probably the most amazing consciousness system in you know this side of the Milky Way. It, it, yeah. It's it's so it, it, it's traumatically sad when you think the potential that we maybe once had, and people get glimpses of it today. It's not like the wiring's still not there to some degree. When you think what 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 we're brought up to think of as normal, you know you. You go to school, and you get some bits of paper, you get a job, you earn some money to buy shit, which is part of the destructive process on the planet. You know, that, that's the standard idea of what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And we have all these ancient traditions, but, but people even today, either spontaneously or through techniques or through plant medicines, they get glimpses of states that are, you know, the transient, I would say, are still just glimpses, but they're so relatively profound that it's enough to pe- for people to go... I'll try and frame it not too bluntly, but to hell with that. Yeah, that's absolutely ludicrous, and it's life changing, and it can just be a couple of minutes. Mm-hmm. So if we could be in those states for longer and much deeper states, what are we, why are we choosing this? You know, why why would we choose this if if there is an option? Yep. And I'm hopeful that if if a rational plan can be made and there's good evidence that that we're going to want to choose something else. You know. Um, I hope that's that's you know that's my hope. Um, if we don't, what can you do? Yeah. So I want to go over one more thing before we kind of sum it up and just give people some practical steps on things that they can do to um, help to connect with their right brain. Um, but before that, um, so one thing that I found really interesting uh, in your book was uh, Rick Strass Strassen's or Strassman's study. Um, Strassman. Yeah. yeah, yeah, where he um, studied the use of DMT on volunteer subjects, and um, just kind of what were your thoughts on the outcomes of those studies, and and just hallucinogenic and other plants that um, are somewhat forbidden, you know, for people to use now, and mm-hmm. and why why do you think that is? Why are they forbidden? Yeah, yeah. Why are they forbidden, and wh- why? Well, it's, they- it's an inevitable product of this this process of decline or reversion to primitive type. It, 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 again, the left sense of self is a sentient self of sense of self, and anything that challenges its control is frightening. Mm. You know, we might not like to own up to the fear. Um, a lot of our anger is about fear. You know, a lot of our decisions are about fear, but it's very frightening. And some of these chemicals. 
are some of the most powerful individual approaches to engage the right hemisphere. I, now, I haven't seen good data on DMT, but certainly the very interesting experiment with LSD in the 1960s before it was um, uh, criminalized. Um, basically, what came out of it was that LSD primarily engages the right hemisphere. So you think about all the hundreds of thousands of chemicals and you think about this asymmetric change, you know, left brain, the structure's a bit different from a right brain. It's not surprising that there might be some chemicals that can preferentially engage the right hemisphere, mm. certainly more than the left. Well, I think that's what some of these plant medicines are. That's all they are. Um, and they can switch some of the lights on a bit, you know, change things a bit. Yeah. Without doing all the, you know, the dietary rebuild, I think the experiences are going to be limited, but relatively speaking, they're profound. And, you know, DMT, LSD, psilocybin, all these other, all these chemicals that are, some are obviously modern, mm -hmm. some have been used for aeons. Um, well, with good reason, you know, they were a way to stimulate the right hemisphere, sometimes enough where it temporarily assumes dominance. The problem is, from an evolutionary perspective, it's still built from rubbish for most of us. It's still missing all the complex biochemistry it was supposed to run on and needs to run on. Mm -hmm. So these, some of these medicines, um, they're, they're a little bit like sticks of dynamite, putting them in the cylinder of your seized car and setting it off. If you're lucky, it'll turn the engine over. Well, great. You go, oh, wow, it's starting to work a bit. But it's a very crude approach unless you strip the engine down, rebuild it, get everything else in place, and then carefully use them. Then it's going to work properly. Well, most of what we're doing now, certainly in our culture, and, you know, Strassman experiment included, maybe not so much way, way back, the yogi tradition where they were, you know, they, they talked about natural diet and eating fruit and stuff and putting these things together. But now, we're, you know, our traditions have become very reductionist. Even the spiritual traditions have been, become reductionist, they become left brain interpretation. So, you know, you have, oh, well, meditation's enough, or yoga's enough, um, diet's not important, or diet's everything, and or, or psychedelics are great, and you don't need to bother with that. You know, it's it's all reductionist stuff. Yeah. Well, you go way, way back, I think all these things were, were used together, because the condition's so serious, you'd use every resource you could, and you'd, you'd, you'd put these things in place in steps in appropriate ways to try and maximize the effect because the condition is so serious. Well, we're not, we're not doing that anymore. We, you know, we, we'll do this one thing or we'll do that one thing or, or drugs are bad and diet's enough or, you know, we, we become very blinkered in our perspective without any evidence to support it. You know, it's usually our own beliefs because the left brain has rigid, you know, it has little capacity to change its beliefs. Um, but I think these things potentially have a very important role. And I mean, you know, they've been used forever and people are very interested in them. But out of context, yeah, you know, they'll give us some insights. But unless you put all the pieces in place and do the full rebuild and get everything prepared, it is a bit like, like I said, it is a bit like using dynamite to, to, to open a safe. Well, you might open it, but what's left inside when you've opened it? You know, you, you really want a much more um, sophisticated approach. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, okay, so just to kind of summarize uh, everything that we've gone over a little <clears> bit on um, specific ways that we can work on suppressing or just controlling or, you know, comforting the left side of our brain to allow for more function of our right side that will allow us to tap into that empathy, you know, compassion, mm. uh, all that sure. sort of stuff. Um, so diet, obviously, you know, fruits and vegetables, Di mainly fruits. Diet's foundation, definitely. Yeah, I, I wouldn't move from that at all. And I'd also say at this stage, you know, we've run through a lot of stuff and I've jumped to summaries a lot because um, it's such a vast area. Um, I'd suggest anybody interested in any of this be prepared to do some research mm -hmm. and read and look online and watch stuff. Not just one perspective, lots of perspectives. Eventually, I think a pattern starts to emerge. But I, I would never suggest anybody take anything as read, including what I'm saying. Check it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. Go and look at the data, you know. Um, and then, yeah, your, your diet you mentioned, obviously. Well, I, I, you know, I say this in a lot of talks now. Diet is an inappropriate word. When you think of what we've got between our ears, it's generally acknowledged to be the most complex thing we know. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal piece of engineering. And diet really 
if you strip it away, it's like advanced molecular engineering. We're choosing how we build and even design. And when I say design, I'm talking about how you change the, the transcription of, of DNA and so on. We can do that by hormonally active foods or not. So, you know, I'm talking about design, construction and fuel at a molecular level. It's incredibly complex stuff. It's shocking when you look at what we're building ourselves with now. You know, it's, it's like it's like... It's like building the space shuttle using the same basic design, but building it from plywood and cardboard and bits of old junk yeah. and then painting it white and going, yeah, it kind of looks the same. It's fine. It's like, <laughs> no way. Right. Well, what we're doing to our brain is a million times worse, and yet we kind of think it's okay. So, yeah, diet, but really advanced molecular engineering. And I don't suggest, I know not everybody would agree with me, I don't suggest jumping straight back into 100% fruit. Hmm. Because remember, our brains change. That means our neuroassimilation system has changed. Sure. And other things have changed, like a gut biome. All sorts of stuff have changed. So I'd say gentle steps, you know, classic transitional stuff away from utter garbage yeah. that's going to kill you one way or another, and slowly build in these things, the classic kind of Greek Hippocrates, whatever, you know, lots of leafy stuff to start with, slowly build the fruit up. And that's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in a week. The younger you are, the fitter you are, the quicker. But I'd still say minimum two to five years and longer if you're older sure. to do a reasonable rebuild. And at that point, you're then ready to start building in other approaches like things that will inhibit the left. So, um, you know, almost the Vipassana Travis tradition is quite a powerful approach. Mm. Its Its whole reality is based on chattering voice either in your head or what we're doing now mm -hmm. if it stops that it actually doesn't have much else about its existence um so you stop talking for long enough it just kind of shuts it down yeah you know, meditation is a similar sort of thing yoga lo lots of these approaches you can start with and start gentle and then you can start building them up um and start looking at techniques that will engage the right hemisphere and anything from music and dance not very rigid you know, the left brain can follow a rigid beat, but if you're looking at more flowing, complex stuff, some of the classical music, some of the modern dance music, which probably is very similar to what went on in ancient trance dance and flowing body movement, something that, that most of us, that we'd feel uncomfortable with to start with, that's your left brain, oh, I don't, want to, I don't know what I'm doing. Just tell it to shut up and get on with it and, and just start moving in those weird ways to the left brain. And that's going to start stimulating it a bit. Um, more extreme approaches, and I emphasize extreme, they're not for beginners, but they are very ancient approaches. Um, I'm pretty convinced that our, because of the asymmetric degeneration or maturation, our left brain has a greater sleep requirement because mm -hmm. it's less efficient, even though it's in charge. So you reduce your sleep. And it doesn't like it, and it gets grumpy and clumsy and whatever, but you push that far enough, and it starts to lose control. And that starts letting the right brain out. This is a very very ancient approach, not something I've invented. I know I've dabbled with it a bit, but mm -hmm. um, and you can look at the plant medicines. Well, I think they specifically target the right hemisphere, at least more so than the left. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's not to begin with. You put in the work first, you do your research, you find the right approaches, you start combining these things. Um, so, so there's a lot of things from dietary change through gentle techniques to more powerful techniques. I wouldn't suggest you rush straight to, you know, staying awake for a week and taking a load of whatever drugs because you might get lucky and have a great time. But you, again, it's it's like it's like taking a, a hand-built sports car out of the barn. It's been there for 50 years and it's partly seized. Yeah, it's a great design but you wouldn't take it on the racetrack and stick your foot down because 99% of the time it's going to blow up. You know, you want to rebuild it. You want to find out how it's supposed to work. And eventually when it's ready, it'll take you for the ride of your life, yeah. but don't rush it. Perfect. Yeah. Great tips. Um, so yeah, I mean, this was outstanding. Uh, you explained everything really well. And I think the viewers are really going to enjoy this. It'll take a lot from it. And for you guys that are watching, I highly recommend that you get Tony's book, uh, Return to the Brain of Eden. There's so much more in the book that we didn't 
have a chance to cover today and it's it's just so <laughs> it's very mind-blowing so um, definitely a must read um, yeah so Tony thanks again for joining this uh, channel and sharing you know the things that you've learned over the last you know 25 plus years and your experiences and just helping the world to gain a little more sanity well fingers crossed I hope so and, and just to reiterate absolutely agree um, we've whizzed through some stuff um, there is a lot more detail we just can't do all the detail all the time so if, yeah. if you find anything I've said brief summaries the detail does exist either in the book or online or in other people's research you'll have to fill in the gaps um, but it does exist I'm you know honestly I'm not making this stuff up yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah thanks for the invite and I, I hope it's uh, of some interest mm -hmm. perfect uh, any any last any last words or anything oh uh, I, I you know I've, I've been working for a, the last year really on, on coming up with better summaries now although this will be unfamiliar I'm quite keen to try these things out, and I've probably already touched on it, but if I had to summarize the human condition at the minute, I'd say it's asymmetric maturation of our brain. One side of our brain has matured more quickly than the other, and we've gone from a time when it was all juvenile to now one side's quite mature, and that's the essence of our problem. Mm. might sound weird and it's unfamiliar, but kind of take that on board, check it out, and see if it makes any sense. And it actually ties in as well, if anybody's interested in this stuff, because I know there's lots of things come off this. A lot of people are interested in human longevity. Lots mm. of traditions talk about great ages and so on. Well, it's never been my central thing, but it's it's cropping up more and more over the last few years that actually species, mammals, most species, they don't actually start aging till they're sexually mature in the way we normally think of aging. Mm. You know, it's about sexual maturation, reproduction. That's the kind of Darwinian model. Makes a lot of sense. If we were in that perpetual state of juvenility, the classic aging wouldn't have occurred. You know, there may be a route back to extreme longevity, and a lot, a lot of people are interested in this. It's not my primary objective. But think about that, you know, that maybe we never got old in the way we think we do now. You know, we stayed forever young, and, you know, I, th I think that's a fascinating idea. Yeah, me too. Definitely. Awesome. Right, cool. Well, well that's, a, that's another interview for another day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. There's plenty of interviews we could do. So, yeah, thanks again. This is terrific. Have a great day. And guys, always follow your raw intuition. Detoxify your mind and body. Be the change you want to see. Small steps towards living better. Small steps to where I want to be.